Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Arnie's. But when I say another episode of The Arnie's, I don't mean just any old episode. Because it's Thursday, and that means it's time for the next episode of the podcast within the podcast. The Boys Talking the Boys. It's pretty self-explanatory if you think about it. It's basically our little special podcast series where we break down each and every episode of Season 2 of Amazon Prime's hit TV show, The Boys. I'm your host, Matt Johnson, excited to break down Episode 6, The Bloody Doors Off, and here with me, as always, the Black Noir to my... I'll be Queen Maeve's girlfriend to your Black Noir... And it's Austin Terry, of course. Austin, how in God's name are you? I'm doing so great. I'm so happy to be back talking another episode of The Boys, and I'm coming to you today with a question. Oh, please indulge us. I want to know, if you were going to be a patient at Sage Grove Hospital, what would you want your Compound V power to be? Damn, that's a good question. I think I'd want the power to, you know how whenever you eat popcorn and like, even if you're careful, you always end up with a kernel or two stuck between your back teeth. I think I'd want the power for that to not happen anymore. That's what I would want Compound B to do to me. What about you, Austin? That seems like a really great way to, to not be incinerated by Lamplighter. That's the goal. I think on that note, you know how popcorn really dries out your mouth? Oh, yeah, dude. Especially those like big movie theater bags yeah. hours after you eat it. Mm -hmm. I think I'm just going to have the ability to slightly moisten my mouth so that mm. way I can eat all the popcorn I want. Thank God. I mean, someone's got to do it. I mean, I think we're in a position right now, you and I have the perfect powers to enjoy popcorn for the rest of our lives and not be burned to smithereens by Sean Ashmore. And if we ever can get back into a movie theater, we can get all those jumbo bags of popcorn that we want. Oh, those will be the days. So, Austin, enough of these lame pleasantries. We're back. It's The Boys. Season 2 continues to wind down. There are only two episodes left, meaning there are only two episodes of The Boys Talking the Boys. Austin, it's coming to a close. I have to ask you. Season two, up to this point, how are we feeling? Before this episode, let's recap the audience. How are you feeling before we went into episode six? Before this episode, I think a little let down, a little underwhelmed, and a little nervous that this may get kind of the, the typical season two treatment where a series launches off super strong, we get a great season one, and then season two really disappoints. Yeah, I was right there with you. I think I may have even been a bit more down on it than you. I think last episode, there was some hope. Um, but yeah, I'm right there with you for the most part. I just was overall really disappointed, especially with the first three episodes. And then even I was like, I was kind of excited for them switching to weekly because I was like, maybe my anticipation week to week will make me more excited. But after episodes four and five, I was just as disappointed. And I really felt like there's only three episodes left. How are they going to turn this around? I really don't see it happening. They did. Episode six of season two of The Boys is the best episode of the series so far, in my opinion. Austin, what are your thoughts on it? Do you agree? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And honestly, I kind of regret last week saying, <laughs> I kind of regret last week saying it felt like vintage The Boys. It felt like, uh, you know, the best episode of the season because I didn't know. I didn't know mm -hmm. what we were capable of. And now that we're here, I never want to go back. I hope every episode continues to be at this level. Yeah, episode five was good. And it definitely did have vintage The Boys moments that made me feel like I was watching the season one again. But man, this episode was just like that times 10. This felt like iconic The Boys in every way. We finally, thank God, had at least every character embarking on the same mission. Did they end up in the same place? No. But at least they were going after the same thing. They were actually working together. There were so many funny moments. There was some amazing, amazing backstory that I really felt gave um, just really amazing presence and depth to characters one character in particular that I was so down on last episode because Frenchie is who I'm referring to. I thought they just were doing him dirty all season. They didn't do anything interesting. And he, I thought he was like the MVP of this episode. He was great. And I loved his backstory. And man, where it ends up, I'm just so much more excited about this season. Like, I feel like the last episodes when each of them ended, I was kind of like, I was like, well, you know, I'm curious to see where they go. But I wasn't excited. Now I cannot wait 
for these next two episodes. Are you there with me, Austin? Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I think I think last last week I was more hesitant, like, uh, I don't know, like I'm gonna watch it, but I don't know if I'm gonna enjoy it. And now I'm like, I can't wait till next Friday. Give me those next two episodes. I can't wait to see where the season goes. Could not agree more, my friends. And everybody, it's your final warning. We've done five episodes so far, but if you're just tuning in for the first time, this is full spoilers. We're not going to, you know, give our spoiler-free thoughts. We're just too excited. we got to get into this episode. This was the biggest one yet, so this is spoilers from this point on. If you have not watched episode six of season two of The Boys, go watch it and then come back to get our thoughts. Yeah, just give us a pause, pause us right here, go watch the episode, and we'll be here when you get back. All right, so without further ado, let's just break down this episode. But let's do it a bit different this time, Austin. Before we get into actual the plot of this episode, I want to know right off the top, give me your number one most favorite thing about this episode, and the one thing, if anything, that you weren't a fan of in it. I think my favorite thing has got to be Lamplighter. He was uh, different than I expected him to be, mm-hmm. like from what we've heard about him this season. Uh, I think different in a good way. And I th- I really like where his character ends up at the end of the episode and his relationship with Frenchie and Mother's Milk. Absolutely. I, I think that would be my number one as well. But for the sake of saying something different, um, the other side of the person you mentioned there, I really just loved getting more of the backstory of Frenchie that was hinted at in season one. We got some glimpses and especially towards the end, whenever we saw more scenes with Butcher and Mallory, that kind of gave us a bit of an impression of what her feelings on Frenchie were. And that in particular paid off in spades in this episode. And I love finding out about how he got recruited originally. I love seeing, you know, the big mistake, if you want to call it that, that led to kind of the dissolution of his both friendship and working relationship with Mallory. Um, I just loved seeing all that. And to what I asked you earlier, now that I'm kind of thinking about it, I'm trying to remember if there was anything I really didn't like. And I've got I've got one thing. I, I kind of just loved the whole thing. So yeah, what, what was the thing that you kind of felt maybe could have been better? It really wasn't even that big of a deal, but I just am not invested enough in Homelander and Stormfront relationship to care about their squabbles. Like, oh, their relationship squabbles so for me it doesn't take up a whole lot of screen time and it's super minor um but if i had to pick one thing i think that was probably the least interesting part of this episode yeah i I think i actually would agree with you there um the weird thing is it's homelander and stormfront are both just absolutely disgusting horrifying irredeemable characters so i agree with you i don't care about their relationship drama either but i guess the reason it was introduced here was so that at the end of the episode, Stormfront can basically be like, I know we've been fighting. Here's how I'm going to make it up to you. I'm going to be completely transparent. And here's my entire, here's my story. Here's who I am. So I, I see why it was necessary so that they could have that moment at the end. But I do agree with you. Like while we were at, while it was actually happening, it was kind of like, eh, I don't really care about this. It did have some funny moments though. Whenever Homelander basically took out the fact that she was more than 20 minutes late to meet him and he just blew up the entire <laughs> set. That was like kind of like classic Homelander. Um, so yeah, that was cool. Um, but yeah, let's just break down this episode. There is a definite A plot here, which is the boys and the entire team, which I loved, infiltrating Sage Grove Hospital based on Starlight's research that she found out about Stormfront in the last episode. So they all go together to infiltrate this hospital and figure out what the hell is going on there. And that leads to discovering all of these soups essentially being raised by Vod, being injected with Compound V to stabilize it, even if you're older, essentially. We meet Lamplighter, who we were introduced to in like a weird 15-second scene in the last episode when he was just credited as like Man and Scrubs. Now I find out he's Lamplighter, played by Sean Ashmore. Stormfront's involved. We get Frenchie's backstory. I mean, like... I just loved that like everything happened here and it was all interesting. So Austin, tell me, what did you think about this main plot about entering Sage Grove and all the secrets we found out inside? Yeah, like you said, the fact that everyone together just gives this episode such a different feeling pacing wise. Like there's no reason to cut around. We can spend more time focusing on the main story. Um, and I I love the holy shit moment whenever that superhero Cindy like blows down the doors and you see all these other like compound V infected super people get loose. Yeah, I completely agree. I thought, um, kind of like you mentioned earlier, I feel like episodes like this where you devote so much time to the A plot and just kind of quick cutaways to like the B and C plots going on, um, I feel like you can kind of 
I I think there's more risk to not stick the landing with it. But like you mentioned earlier, I thought this episode just had such an amazing ending. I love that Mallory comes back and it seems like, wait, what's going on? Did like the boys take Lamplighter with them? And then they open the back of this ambulance and he's not restrained and she's about to shoot him because we find out that in this episode, we do get like, you know, the official, I guess you could just say more confirmation that he did burn her grandchildren alive. Um, we do get some backstory on he wasn't he wasn't aware that they were there. He was trying to kill Mallory based on orders from Vought. Um, and then it's this really cool scene where we find out that he and Frenchie, Frenchie, who probably hates Lamplighter more than anybody, they're very similar. And they deal with trauma in a similar way. And Lamplighter is like the first soup, or I guess you could just say like the member of the seven, that seems to have some remorse for their actions. I feel like... A train to a degree does seem to feel like I wish I hadn't killed my girlfriend. Um, but he did so much other shitty stuff that he doesn't seem to care. The deep, since he's involved with the church of the collective, it's kind of hard to tell if he really does feel remorse. I can't really tell. Um, but it was nice for once to see a character actually kind of like Maeve. Maeve does seem like a better person. But I, it's hard to tell with all these members of the seven that are such <laughs> bad people. But you know what I mean. Similarly to Maeve, we get to actually see somebody that feels remorse and wants to do something about it. And I think that's where the this, uh, rest of the season is going to go, because he wants Mallory to kill him, end his suffering. Frenchie's like, all you'd be doing is ending his torment. There's nothing worse than that. And then it's like, what are we going to do with him? And I'm kind of been thinking they're going to use him to infiltrate Vought in some way. So... I just love the way they ended this episode. It is kind of hard to buy Lamplighter's remorse, though, when the only reason he's working at this clinic is to just incinerate innocent people who have been trapped here and injected with Compound V. The reason I can buy his remorse a little bit, and it is jarring, you are right, because, I mean, literally, we see, like, security cam footage of him burning young people alive, um, and he describes it later as getting rid of the evidence. The reason, and he's, of course, he's irredeemable, I'm not saying he is, but... I think the reason I can still buy his feelings is that I just genuinely feel like he doesn't think he can do anything else. And as a member of the Seven, I guess his life is a little bit different. He can't completely stay out of, like, the public eye. And if they're going to kind of shove him under the rug, they're going to have to – it's not like he's just going to be like, okay, Lamplighter, you killed those kids. We don't want you to work for us anymore. Bye. Like, they're still (laughs) going to force him to do shit. So I kind of feel like it's a combination of them making him work for them, him being scared to, like, run away from Vought, I think kind of similarly to how Maeve might feel. And then also, I mean, it's like, what else is this guy going to do? You know, he's been a soup his whole life, being a member of the Seven. And so now I think he's just like, okay, I'll just go through the motions and burn these people alive. Obviously, he's a scumbag, but I did at least buy the remorse aspect and the regret that he felt for that action in the past. And I love that he does kind of kind of like how Frenchie blames him. I like that Lamplighter actually kind of challenged Frenchie a bit. Like, if you knew they were there, why the fuck didn't you stop me? I had no idea they were there. And I liked how that kind of led more into the backstory as well. So, ugh. I just love I love this episode so much. <laughs> so. And I also do love these flashback scenes. I think it makes all these characters feel more fleshed out. Um, I think yeah. it, I like that we get a little bit more insight into Mallory and the rest of the boys' relationship. And I also genuinely laughed at that scene where they're giving Lamplighter shit for his costume. Yeah, this was cool because the episode starts. The opening scene is a flashback to like eight years ago. And we see Cherie, I think is her name, or at least that's what... Um, Whatchamacallit, that's what uh, Frenchie calls her. Um, we see her again, who we've seen him have scenes with in the present. We see an old friend that he had, and they're doing drugs together, and they're making bombs to go rob a bank. And then this all leads him to be recruited by Mallory because she's impressed that he made a bomb to rob a bank that didn't kill anybody. It just knocked them all out. Um, he gets caught. He gets recruited, so his friends won't be like arrested. But I like how it didn't end there. I like kind of like how you said. I like that we actually then the next flashback scene was seeing like the OG. I guess if you want to call it the boys team. I liked how like we get to see five years before the current show. We get to see a younger Frenchie, Mother's Milk, Billy Butcher, Mallory, kind of working together and trying to take Vought down before all the events of the show even started. I thought this was so cool. And like you said, it's funny to see them give Lamplighter shit in his, like, in his really weird costume. But I also, like you said, we also get cool emotional moments. Not just for Frenchie. I like seeing Mother's Milk so excited to show his friends the ring he bought to propose to his fiance. Like, there were some really great moments here. So what did you think about where the flashbacks led and 
we get to then see kind of the tragic mistake. We don't get to see Lamplighter burn the house down, but we do see Frenchie have to leave the situation and go help a friend that OD'd. How would you feel about that? And how would you feel about Frenchie kind of coming clean in the present and to his friends and not wanting to be let off the hook? How do you feel about all those themes and elements? Yeah, I think it leads to a great moment for Frenchie, um, because I think him leaving to go save a friend feels very on brand for his character. And Mm -hmm. I'm glad that he didn't like leave in a way where like he went to do drugs. I'm glad he left for a good reason, um, because I think that like, I think that makes him more redeemable. And I also love the line where Mother's Milk says, where Mother's Milk says, dude, we would have left you off the hook. And Frenchie's like, no, 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 I, I don't want to be off the hook. I feel terrible for this. Like, I just think it makes Frenchie such a much more enjoyable character to root for in this show. Completely agree. I think it kind of shows off the difference between him and Lamplighter. They feel the same thing about the event, but at, you're right. I, I'm so glad Frenchie at least left for a noble reason. I was so scared it was going to be like, like you said, to just go get high or something like that. But this was really cool. And then to get kind of the tragic follow-up whenever Lamplighter seems genuinely like, well, did your friend live? And he's like, yeah, he lived. I saved him. But because I then left to go find you again, never got to talk to them again. And then he died of an OD like a few months later. It was like, oh, God, it was so sad. And I I just think this came at the right time. Yeah, and it was also kind of nice to see like a more bought-in version of Frenchie in this episode because you can tell that he is very serious about their mission and for the majority of the show Frenchie kind of has been like a bit of a fuck up so it was kind of nice to see like a different side of Frenchie in these flashbacks as well yeah I completely agree I think we really needed this and I think this came at the right time because I liked Frenchie in season one he did feel a bit more like comic relief um, but there was always a darkness to him and a sadness and it just felt so weird kind of pacing wise for the pacing wise for the character development because as we've talked about in this season i think he's been not the actor but the use of frenchy up until episode six of the season has just been garbage in my opinion he just follows kamiko around to almost like a creepy extent and but well and the use of the use of kamiko has been oh, it's awful been terrible. Well. This, this, that whole that whole subplot with them has been so bad so this was like you said just a really nice palate cleanser in this episode for those characters yeah because for her at the very least what she was doing was in response to a tragic thing that happened that we saw in episode three where Stormfront murders her brother. So we at least understand, I I suppose, her perspective. Whereas for Frenchie, it was just him following her around, someone that he liked that we could never really... I guess they seem close, but it's like, what's their relationship? I don't really know. And then it was nice to see even that kind of come to a head at the end of this episode where he apologizes to her. Um, He acknowledges that how he was going about it was weird and wrong and he was genuinely sorry and that he wouldn't do that to her anymore. And then we kind of get to see the way she responds to it in her own way, which does seem to almost be like longing. So I think we'll see more of their relationship. But I liked that we at least got acknowledgement from him that – it's been a little awkward, but I wouldn't blame even the character. I think it's just the writing for Frenchie this season has been so bad. So thank God we got the stuff in this episode because it was so sorely needed, I feel like. And then on the other side of that, I also like that they, they found a way for uh, Starlight to be involved with the boys again in this episode as well. Yeah, that was cool. Um, I was thinking about that too because whenever I was first watching it, I was like, oh, okay, so we're going to get another Starlight and Huey thing, you know, like a subplot. That's cool. Um, but really, when you think about it, Huey is, you know, incapacitated really quick. Basically, one of the people that Cindy frees from Sage Grove escapes and kind of just bumps into Butcher, Huey, and Starlight, who are essentially keeping watch for the rest of the boys. And in kind of a moment where this kid gets scared, he uses his power and throws their van, just makes it go for a loop. Huey's inside. Butcher kills the kid. And then Huey walks out, of course. Totally seems fine, but then we pan down, the camera does, and we see that he has this huge, just huge piece of shrapnel in him. From this point on, Huey's a non-factor in this episode, and really what they were setting up, which I thought was so smart, was actually the relationship we're exploring here is Starlight and Butcher, who are characters that have been at odds, not for... (laughs) <laughs> like the fault of Starlight, because obviously she's trying to help. Butcher doesn't see like what this person is putting herself through to help these people. And I'm so glad also, just on top of all the great Frenchie and Kamiko stuff, we get this. How do you feel about this? Because this was another highlight for me, watching them bicker the episode, but then get to a point at the end where they both acknowledge how much they care for Huey. And they also at the same time kind of acknowledge kind of um, 
I guess it's more so Butcher acknowledging that Starlight is a good person that's actually helping them doing things for the right reasons. How'd you feel about all that? Because I thought it was great. Yeah, I'm really glad that we didn't have more Butcher Huey fighting and making up again. I'm glad that we switched right. kind of the dynamic of that. And I also really like how this doesn't end with now Butcher and Starlight are best friends. No. It just this ends with Butcher and Starlight have a mutual agreement that they're both doing what they can uh to survive in this world i guess and that the thing that's really going to hold them together is both of theirs affection for huey yeah that's a great point i didn't think about it from the butcher perspective because you're so right i mean by pairing these three characters together to keep watch we so could have run into the same thing where huey and starlight what's the status of our relationship or butcher and huey man i love you butcher and butcher's like fuck you huey i hate you and then by the end of the (laughs) episode they're like no we do love each other but it was just such a great premise uh, for these characters and this actual, like, the storyline itself for Huey to get. And, like, he basically just goes into a coma for the rest of the episode. And so Starlight and Butcher have to work together and thus come close in order to save somebody else that they really feel a closeness to. So it was unexpected. And you're right. They don't become best friends, but they at least seem like they're going to be able to be cordial from this moment on. So I am glad that this show is also able to stay interesting without a huge involvement from Huey as well. Yeah, that's a good point, because he really was introduced as like, I don't know if main character is the right word, but he was kind of like the character, he was like the Luke Skywalker, where he's supposed to be- He's the everyman. Yeah, the audience is supposed to look to Huey and go, oh, that's the way I, that's my POV for the show. Um, But you're, you're totally right. The show has kind of evolved to a point they've- built these characters up enough so they can cut away from him and it's totally fine. And Jack Quaid, who plays Huey, is still great. It's just we've reached a point where we can focus on other characters, which is cool. I think for most of this season, they have mishandled some of the storylines and some of them are just boring, but at, at the very least, we they are experimenting. So even though I haven't loved most of the season, I do I can at least respect the fact that they're trying something to, you know, show off all these characters and give them their own storylines. So what did you think about Stormfront being involved with the hospital and her showing up multiple yeah, times? Yeah, so I was gonna say this is the last kind of part of the hospital subplot we gotta talk about. So basically It was a great surprise whenever we see Stormfront leave Homelander and it seems like she's going to go to Vought Tower, but then she just flies right over on almost seeing Starlight, Butcher, and Huey. And it's like, okay, she's at the hospital too. And then she's – it's weird because it's like – at first I was like, I guess is she just going to visit Lamplighter? Like what's their relationship? And then no, then it's kind of weird because she seems to be running things in a weird way. She's like walking in and out of rooms, talking to patients. They clearly know her to some extent. They see her a lot, I guess. And she's like the one, I guess, giving the okay for somebody to stay alive versus, nope, this subject, no reason to continue. And I was like, that's weird. Why is Stormfront involved with this hospital? And then it kind of escalates to a point where, like we mentioned earlier, Homelander is unhappy with how she's treating him. And we get to the end of the episode where we get some pretty shocking revelations that kind of ties in all the mystery. Well, I guess it kind of, I guess, uh, ties into a bow, I guess you could say. It kind of finishes the mystery of Stormfront subplot, like since episode one, where we don't know where this person has come from. It also resolves the Liberty storyline from earlier in the season where we revealed that Stormfront was Liberty. But all that said, I did not expect the reveal at the end of this episode. So Austin, why don't you fill people in on that? And what were your thoughts on it? So Stormfront apparently was a Nazi and married Frederick Vought, the founder of Vought. And she was the very first person to ever receive a compound V mm-hmm. injection. Yeah, exactly. So, I was... And I think she's lying. Oh, about what exactly? I think parts of this are true, but... She says, like, Homelander, you're the one that we've been waiting for and all that stuff. And I really think she's just trying to appease Homelander for her. I still think she's got her own agenda. I don't think she wants Homelander to take control. Um, so I think I think right here, I think here she's really just telling Homelander what he wants to hear. Yeah, it's a good point. Because the episode was actually, for me, effective in that sense. Because when it got to – because this entire time that she's been, like – doing her thing and then eventually getting with Homelander, I was like, okay, obviously she just needs – like the, the quote unquote leader of the seven on her side to fulfill her mission, whatever it may be. But I got to say, when we got to this reveal and she starts talking about where she came from, the fact that she was with Vought, and then she's obviously so intimately familiar with Compound V. Whenever she says like, Homelander, you're the one we've been waiting for. I need you to help me basically 
destroy the other races of the world who are lesser than, and we can rule the world with superhuman dominance. I was kind of like, I don't know. I might believe her. Maybe this is actually what her mission is. I think she's telling the truth about her origin and everything. I think the goal of her plan is what she's lying about. I don't know if she necessarily needs Homelander's help. I think she's kind of just trying to keep him on a leash. It definitely could be. I guess I'm kind of at that sweet spot where I feel like it could go either way and I would believe it and I would be fine with it. Um, So we'll see where the next two episodes go because I I have to imagine we'll at least get an answer to what you're saying. I feel like we're going to get her definitive motivation or at least confirmation on what it already seems to be by the end of this season. That being said... I mean, so many interesting things here. I kind of expected, based on the Liberty storyline, that they would reveal at some point that Stormfront was kind of the originator of Compound V, and she was probably the first person to take it. She was probably the first superhuman. Um, I did not expect that she was married to Frederick Vaught, and that kind of has some interesting implications that made certain things make sense. Now, the first thing I thought, I want to get your thoughts on this, was, so does she have a financial stake of any kind in Vought, the company? Because if so, then it kind of makes things make a bit more sense. Why she just shows up. Why Stan Edgar just lets her on the team. Why he's, I guess, not maybe not fighting for her, but will appease her. You know, why she knows so much about Compound V, how she somehow randomly knew that Starlight was the one that exposed it. So I'm kind of curious if like what her relationship with the company itself is. So what were your thoughts on that? Did any of that kind of hit you? Did it make you look back on some of the other weird scenes we've seen with her and give clarity in any way? Yeah, I think she's for sure got to have a financial stake uh, in the company. Um, And she honestly may be like the secret CEO or something like that, especially if she was married to Frederick Vaught. Right. Um, It kind of just makes me really want to know, like, where has she been all this time and why does nobody else really know about her? You know what I mean? Yeah, I guess the the big question would be why now? You know, why come back now, especially when she was already clearly operating as a superhuman in I, th- I believe the 70s, they said, I don't know if we, they, re- they referred to the Liberty storyline. So why wait this long to come back? And now I also want to know why she stopped acting as Liberty as well. Like what caused her to kind of retire and disappear from the public eye? Yeah, the one thing that I'm still unclear on, and I know based on the way they're building it up as a storyline, I know we're going to get some resolution to it. But like we talked about last week, um, Stormfront basically told A-Train that she was once involved with the Church of the Collective. So my thought is... Why? And also for the deep, it's like he doesn't really he has to use any help he can get if he wants to get back on the seven. He needs Maeve's help. He needs the church's help. But for Stormfront, kind of like we mentioned, why would she need any help getting on this team if this is what she really wanted? Like, couldn't she just go to Stan Edgar and be like, I'm married to Frederick Vaught. You know that you know how much power I have. I own this company. I'm on the team. Like, why was she involved with the church? That's kind of my big wonder right now for that character. I feel like that's the one thing that I'm still a bit iffy on. Did you have any thoughts on that that made sense to you? I'm just glad we still have two more episodes because now I have like so many more questions about this season. But similar to you, I want to know where this Church of the Collective storyline is going. Mm -hmm. And then since we mentioned the deep, I'll just say it again. Very effective way to use him here. Four to seven minutes of screen time. Becoming my favorite character that deep. I got to say, again, we've already talked about this already this season, but I find it so interesting how this show is able to take these just disgusting human beings, but still give them like really funny moments. Like, why is it that the deep after what he did in season one is somehow able to be comic relief? Because I was just busting out laughing whenever he was walking up to A-Train. A-Train's like, what are you doing here? And he's like, hey, man. A-Train doesn't see him. He's like, it's me. I'm over here. And then A-Train's like, why are you here? And he's like, oh, I came here to see. And it's just the most cliche thing. He's like, oh, wait, I shouldn't say me. I'll just stop talking. And then he just doesn't say anything. And then A-Train seems even more suspicious. So funny. And then, of course... I actually wasn't really expecting it at first, but then he kind of drops, I guess you don't need their help, and starts to walk away. And this kind of effectively drags A-Train into the Church of the Collective storyline. And at first, it seems like he's not really going to take the bullshit. Um, He and the Deep have an awkward dinner with, I can't remember the character's name, but essentially the leader of the church, or at least the current leader, or the figurehead. Um, And this guy- Well, and to your point about- uh, the deep being funny. This scene here, 
is what made me bust out laughing, where this church leader goes, why don't we have a talk and really open up ourselves? And A-Train's like, I'm not doing this. And then he looks at the deep and is like, are you buying this? And then the deep is totally bought in and just goes, yeah, I want to kill you, A-Train. Yeah. I don't want to feel that way anymore. Made me laugh so hard. Mm-hmm. And this was interesting because, I mean, this guy somehow knows some of A-Train's secrets. He's like, you're in all this debt. You're off the team. You're a drug addict. You have a heart condition. You could die at any moment. You need our help. We'll get you back on. And the question is, I guess it has to do with Stormfront. I just don't know what it is. But how is this church able to get people on this team? Like, how does that work? What pull do they have? What is their connection to Vought? Is it just Stormfront? Because I just don't know, but I'm so curious. Because I feel like this storyline has to pay off in some way. And I genuinely have no idea, which is one thing I'm definitely excited to see. You know what this like Church of Collective uh, storyline really reminds me of? It reminds me of the uh, Lord of Light storyline from Game of Thrones. I get the mysterious and vague and sometimes creepy vibes for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it feels like this, this group of people have, has way more power than they've been letting on. That's a good way Um, to put it. So I, I I just really, really want to know what's happening here. Yeah. I have no idea, but I think you actually hit it spot on there. I think they clearly, I mean, although it doesn't really seem like it, they must have some major pull or they have major like blackmail on someone who the hell knows, but they have strings to pull. So I'm curious how that's going to all unfold as this goes on. Before we wrap up, we've got to talk about my favorite character. we got to do some Maeve talk. Uh, we do. And I was so disappointed because I love the scenes we got, but just sorely not enough. Not enough Maeve still. I will say I am happy to be left wanting more. That's, that's I feel true. like I got that's too true. much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so Maeve gets the deep to find her a GoPro uh, from the ocean Which Uh, which that again, that was also hilarious. I had no fucking idea that last episode when Maeve goes up to the deep and like her whole thing is like, look, you help me. I'll try and get you back on the seven, even though I think you're a piece of shit. I could not have imagined that his role in helping her would be to make use of his whales or fucking animals <laughs> and go find the wreckage of the plane from season I one. Also, I also love the part where he's, I can't remember the animal, but when he's trying to tell her, like, you don't believe the conversation I had with these flounders. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. <laughs> oh, my God. So, yeah, no, you're right. So, it starts out in a funny place, and that's kind of her her first scene, and she only has one other scene in the episode, and it's at the very end. So, kind of talk about where that went and what your thoughts were on it. Yeah, so Elena um, is trying to find Mabe's phone and stumbles upon a video. And and basically what we find out is this this GoPro that she recovered was from the plane mm-hmm. that Mabe and Homelander let crash in season one. Right. And Elena sees this video and then Mabe says, hey, like, I didn't have a choice here, but I'm going to use this to take Homelander down. And again, you know, she's been saying that. I'm just so curious when that will happen, how it will happen. Like, will she just leak this, what that would mean for both her and the public's view on Homelander once again. Like, there's pretty dire stakes here. I'm still worried for her, as we've talked about throughout this season. I feel like once she pulls the trigger on Homelander, I just am scared that she's not going to be long for this world, and even Elena as well. I mean, that's the tricky thing with Homelander. He gets away with so much. Like, if she leaks this, I just feel like even if he's able to later fix his image, he's going to kill both these people in the process. So I'm so worried. I'm not as much worried anymore about Maeve dying as I was. I'm more worried that she's going to let the audience down and end up kind of only using this footage to benefit her and Elena and nobody else. Oh. Like I'm, I don't think she's actually going to try to really take Homelander and the Seven down. I think she's just going to use this as a way to get herself and Elena out of the Seven and safe. And maybe that's kind of an interesting play they could make to show that Look, Maeve, she's not as bad as most of these people, but she's still not great. You know what I mean? Like, it's like all the people on the seven have these dark secrets. And that's actually a pretty interesting point. I wouldn't be surprised if over the next couple episodes, Elena gets mad at her because she basically just exposes it for that reason. But she still just wants them to get away, but isn't going to get justice in any other sense. That could be interesting. I, I wouldn't be too surprised. Obviously, I hope more because we love Maeve. We love... Dominique Minnelli, McElliot, I believe is the name, uh, the actress that plays her. Um, so I hope for more. I hope that she turns out to be a nicer person. But, you know, with the people on the seven, who who's to tell at this point? 
Well, and I think I think we really want her to be good because she really is the Wonder Woman character. Yeah. And it's just so hard to see somebody in that role be bad. So I think I think that's the main reason we really want her to be good. Although she really hasn't shown us a whole lot looking back. Exactly. She really hasn't shown us a whole lot that she is, you know, all good. Maybe not all good, but she really hasn't shown us a whole lot like saying like that she wants to be better. Like she just wants Elena to be safe. That's really all she cares yeah. about. And that's why I think maybe you could be on the right track in terms of where the storyline could go. So this did remind me of one more thing, actually, you know, kind of talking about how Maeve is a character that I think she's a bit more noble, a bit more altruistic, at least compared to the other members of the Seven. So let's talk about another one that, you know, I do believe in her heart is trying to do good. And I think for the most part succeeds and always tries to do the right thing. But in this episode, interestingly, and we kind of skipped over it earlier, she kind of inadvertently does something that obviously the world would construe as bad. Uh, we see Starlight in this episode after Huey has fallen into his kind of his coma. Um, Butcher, obviously, and Starlight are trying to get him to safety and they need to commandeer a car. And this leads to the person they're trying to take the car from not wanting to give up the car, pulling a gun on them. Starlight finally able to charge her powers, flings him, and he ends up bashing the back of his head on the sidewalk. So I'm not talking about that specifically, but what did you think about the conversation right after where they're in the car and Butcher is kind of asking her her thoughts on that? And she essentially is like, you know, obviously I'm not happy I did that, but I'm kind of surprised that I don't feel as much remorse. How would you feel about that kind of dialogue and what that might mean for Starlight going forward? Who this is a character that's been basically all good up until this point. Yeah, this felt really unnecessary to me. Um, cause Starlight is the only member and the, really the only superhero being in this world that stays good or as good as she can in this world. Uh, As I don't, I just don't know if there's any need to like make her turn slightly darker and just having, having her kill that guy just seemed so unnecessary to me. Like if anything, it felt like there was a way to incapacitate him to where he's not, he's not dead or just have Butcher do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think it was all done on purpose. Um, I think... The reason what I said earlier was that the act wasn't as important as the conversation is. I think she just tries to charge her power so quickly. I don't think she's doing this on purpose. I think she gets charged up, just tries to push the guy, and I guess it just wasn't far enough to make him hit the grass on the side. He just hits his head. Um, Or maybe she lost control of her powers because she was so stressed about Huey. Yeah, it could be. That could be interesting if they do that. Like. Maybe yeah. maybe later we do see her wrestling with this and she does realize she did lose control in that moment. I guess that could be interesting. I would have to imagine she'll wrestle with it in some capacity. It was just interesting to basically hear her say, I'm sorry that that happened. I'm just I'm surprised that after this having happened, I don't feel what I would have expected I would feel. That was kind of the interesting moment where I'm like, what could that mean for Starlight going forward? I don't I don't see her being as bad as other people on the seven, like this being a moment that makes her be bad. I just thought it was interesting. I'm not really entirely sure what it could mean. Maybe it's like she's seen so much darkness from other members of the seven. She's seen all the fucked up shit that they do that now when she accidentally does something bad, maybe she's kind of desensitized to it. Maybe that's the play. I don't know, but it was definitely interesting. Yeah, I just, I just really fucking hope we don't get like some scenes later on where Starlight does start becoming a little bit more darker, yeah. and then Huey has to like bring her back to to being good. Like, I hope we yeah. don't get any of that bullshit. Yeah. I agree with you there. I, I'm not interested in that. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I feel like a lot of the, a lot of these storylines ends in a place like we'll see. Like, where the hell is Stormfront and Homelander going to go now? What is Stormfront's reveal as being a Nazi married to Frederick Vaught? What will that lead to? What will Lamplighter being left alive and <laughs> kind of being forced to work with the boys lead to what what is all this stuff going to lead to i don't know but i'm so excited to find out over these next two episodes before we wrap up there is one more thing i want to ask you about um what do you think about our closing shots of yeah. uh cindy yeah cindy our uh exploding head superhero what do you think about her getting out and do you think we'll see being seeing more of her this season <sighs> this was the one that i don't know because it's like do we see more of her this season um, I guess I feel like it would almost be weird after all of these storylines were left on amazing cliffhangers. Like if they bring her back just next episode for her to fight somebody, I don't know how interesting that would be. Maybe it's a long play where she comes back in season three in a bigger role. Who knows? Um, but to answer your question, I thought it was an effective like closing shot just in the way it tied up like the main plot of the hospital storyline. But yeah, that being said, I have no idea where it's going to go. Um, 
I guess it just ends up being in a fight. I don't know how interesting that will be, like I said. so Yeah, she's just a really intimidating presence. Um, and she doesn't seem evil. Like She just seems someone who is trapped and really got stuck in a shitty situation. So I think there is room to have uh, maybe some, maybe not this season, but have her character come back in a role later on. Yeah, I would hope so. I think it was also, speaking of that, it was interesting to see the hospital because based on flashbacks in season one, that was kind of Homelander's his background. He grew up in just captivity in a sense, being just tested on constantly trying to refine and understand these powers. And so like, theoretically, if Cindy had been left in that situation for longer, she probably would have become, a, become another Homelander. Whereas now, I, I agree with you, is everything she did seemed more like in defense of herself. So it's like, okay, I, I'm, I'm okay with it for now. But as it goes on, it's like, is she going to be just another villain for them to fight? Will she be a bit more of a sympathetic character? I, I, I have to imagine we'll see her again. I would, I would be shocked if we don't ever see that character again. So either way, I'm excited to see where it goes. I just hope it's not like the bland, boring, she comes back to fight the boys for one episode. That That's not what I want to see. Yeah, I could also see her being used as like another manufactured terrorist for Homelander to yeah. go after as well. Yeah, exactly. To maybe save his public image in a sense. Who knows? Um, either, either one of those would make sense to me, but... That was our closing shot, so certainly important to talk about. So um, I think somehow, Austin, we covered every single moment in this episode. We hit everything, and I'm not surprised because it was all memorable. Do you have any closing thoughts since we've covered the entire episode? Anything else that you wanted to highlight that you liked or didn't love or are excited about going forward? I just want to echo your excitement since we have been kind of down in the last few episodes. Um, this episode was fantastic. I cannot wait to see where episodes nine and 10 go. And I am back on the boys train. Completely agree. Can't wait to see where else it goes. Um, yeah, I feel like we've just praised this episode so much. I don't really have much else to say. The one thing I will say going forward, and this won't be just like a season two thing or like, I'm just saying about like, this show going forward, I would love if they somehow found really great thematic and relevant ways to do character origins, like they did with Frenchie in this episode. If they can find ways to do this throughout a normal present-day episode with Maeve, with Mother's Milk, with anybody. I mean, The Deep, A-Train, Starlight, I don't care. I just love the way they handled the flashbacks here. Probably better than anything we've seen in this series up until this point. So I would love if they were able to find kind of, you know, not like every episode, but, you know, occasional ways to do stuff like that again. Yeah, I think that'd be super cool. But um, the boys writers, since we know you listen to every episode, do not <laughs> give me a whole episode in the past because I do not need yeah. that. We need the story to keep moving forward. Do it the way you did it in this episode. Exactly. Yeah, I don't want like a full flashback, but I just like the way that the flashbacks here were both relevant to the story and also thematically were so like just right, it was they were what we needed to see so it was just perfect so we'll see we'll see if we get more 10 out of 10, ten yeah honestly this was a 10 out of 10 episode and i cannot wait for episode 7 and 8 and i hope i know it i know it's like a tough thing to say i know i don't want to jinx it but i just hope that even if they're not quite as good i just hope that episode 7 and 8 keep this level of momentum going that's all i need it doesn't need to be perfect but i just want like this like barreling speed to continue going i agree Anyway, everybody, this was your episode of The Boys Talking The Boys, covering Season 2, Episode 6. We will be back next Thursday covering Episode 7, and we obviously, as you can tell, we cannot wait. Austin, fill the audience in. Obviously, this is our Thursday kind of special episode. What can the audience expect for our main episodes going forward? What, do the, what does our audience need to know? What are we throwing out there? Yeah, well, everybody, thank you so much for listening. Um, as Matt said, this is just our special bonus series. If you want to check out our main episodes, those drop every Tuesday. This week, we did a review of the Netflix original movie, The Devil All the Time. Be sure to check that out. And we are in the middle of an ongoing bi-weekly Star Wars series, and our episode on Rogue One will be out this coming Tuesday. And also, guys, just to give you a little bit of a tease, this month is going to be, I think, my favorite month of content so far. Obviously, like Austin said, we got Star Wars continuing, Rogue One, and Last Jedi. Obviously, two pretty interestingly reviewed <laughs> kind of movies in the Star Wars franchise, so I'm excited to break those down. And we have a lot more TV coming, which I'm excited about. I think we're going to try and review The Haunting of Bly Manor. I think we're going to try and talk about some scary movies. Mandalorian comes out this month, so... 
man, we're gonna have, we have a lot of interesting episodes coming up. I can't wait. Yeah, we won't uh, we won't give it away, but we are going to be getting a little spooky for Halloween. I'm excited. I cannot wait. We're already planning it a month in advance, so it can be like the best episode possible. So. We're stoked. This is going to be a great month. I think a great rest of the year for our show. I'm so glad that, you know, this is probably, I should probably say this for a main episode, but screw it. For all the people watching The Boys out there, I love this show, guys. Not not The Boys. I'm talking about the freaking Arnie's, okay? <laughs> like, I love this <laughs> podcast. We started this year. I'm so stoked. It's going to be another great year. Another great year. It's our first year. I- I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> I'm starting in season two of The Arnie's. But it's, it's exciting stuff, people. I think keep an eye out for all the episodes coming up because... I think we've really refined a nice schedule. We have some exciting stuff coming down the pipeline. Yeah, we, we've had a ton of fun putting this together. And if you want to make sure you never miss any of that exciting content coming up, make sure you subscribe. And if you want to help us grow, please share us with a friend. We really do appreciate that. Yeah, and go ahead and follow us over on Instagram at the Arnie's. Follow us there. Leave us a like. Leave us a comment. You know, DM us your thoughts on the boys, your thoughts on Star Wars, our ongoing series, what, you know, kind of scary movies you're into, what you're looking forward to the rest of the year. Just leave us your thoughts because we'd love to read them. And if you have any topics that you'd like us to discuss, send those our way as well because who knows? Next year we have lots of open slots. We'd love to talk about what you guys want us to talk about as well. All right. We'll be back on Tuesday. Thank you guys so much for listening. See you then. See ya.